Um, good. Um, I hope everyone's back. I think the mic is also back, at least a, a little bit back. Um, so, so far, basically, we talked a lot about how to actually make arrays, how to make registers, let's say. Um, second part, um, and actually also the rest, um, will of course also be uh, focused on how we can, you know, have interactions between atoms, which form basically the basis of our quantum simulation, and of course also the basis of quantum gates, and I will describe that a little bit. So I will uh, first explain uh, Wittberg atoms and how they interact, and then I will show you some applications. And I might cut the application part a bit short, uh, uh, but I'm happy to, to continue asking questions. I think it's, it's much more important that you get the basis and, and the basics, and, and uh, then I will, I will uh, pick a bit uh, in the end uh, what I will show in terms of actual applications. So, um, Rittberg atoms. Uh, what are Rittberg atoms? Uh, well, Rittberg atoms are um, very um, highly excited um, atoms, so they're atoms excited to states very close to the ionization threshold, and uh, that's actually nice, because if you think about what that means, is you take an electron uh, from, let's say, an alkali atom, just to be concrete, take the, the valence electron, you move it very far out, what this electron will see is it will see basically a single charged core. Yeah? And um, the further away it is, the more the core will look like a proton, if, in a way. Uh, and this means that uh, what you will get is you will get very much uh, a hydrogen-like, uh, spectrum hydrogen-like properties. And uh, where you see this the best is actually when you look at the energy levels of these ripper states, these highly excited states, because they have exactly the same form um, as the hydrogen um, atom with a, a small correction, uh, which is this delta um, delta Lj, that also depends on the quantum number, which is the so-called quantum defect. So it's a, a hydrogenic spectrum with a small correction. And uh, the wave functions also look a lot like uh, what you know from, from hydrogen. So this is just a concrete example for 31 p uh, to be concrete. And uh, you can see actually that the size of these groups atoms is, is already quite substantial. So the ground state uh, is about uh, an angstrom uh, um, level um, in terms of its size, and this is uh, uh, many, many times larger. Um, these ripper atoms um, have basically uh, two ways to decay. So either when you excite them, of course, they can decay directly back to the ground state and with a radiative process, but they can actually also decay to neighboring uh, states, yeah? to neighboring ripper states. It's the second decay path. And this uh, occurs by uh, simulated black body radiation or black body transitions, rather. So uh, this is actually why uh, they can also, you know, let's say decay upwards. Yeah? So they can basically uh, be stimulated to neighboring ripper states either up or down just by the uh, by the background. Um, the transitions are in the, in the several uh, of gigahertz regime, depend of course on n, and so this is also where we have a significant. Um, population of black body photons still. Um, what is also uh, kind of uh, nice uh, um, is that uh, because, you know, this uh, property that uh, far away from the core, looking at the core, everything looks uh, like a singly charged uh, core, uh, it's kind of true no matter which element you pick. So the rubidium atom, you look at the Rydberg properties, they're actually very similar to the Rydberg properties um, of, a, of a strontium atom, just because in the end, uh, you know, Looking from far, the core looks like a, a singly charged um, entity. Um, some important facts about these Rydberg atoms. So first of all, here is just this, uh, the size comparison. So here's a, um, a rubidium ground state um, uh, orbital um, compared to this Rydberg orbital. It's, it, you know, it's a neat dot, basically. Um, facts, um, or the most important thing is that if you look at the properties of these Rydberg atoms, they all scale the principal quantum number, and this is of course very useful if you want to back to the envelope estimates, um, and it also tells you, you know, a good idea of, of where you should start and at what end you should start looking when you want to do specific things. Um, some, some concrete uh, properties, if you look at the diameter, the scales with the principal quantum number squared, and this give, gets you then to, to, you know, the size of about 250 nanometers uh, in, in diameter. The lifetime also increases with higher n. Yeah, that's an important feature. It increases with n squared if you take into account this radiative, uh, sorry, the non radiative decay to the block nearby by Rydberg states through black body radiation. And it can be up to you know, several tens of microseconds. If you go up uh, in n, as I said, for example, to, to 
60, 70, then it, it uh, approaches 100 microseconds. Um, also, uh, the polarizability, so the sensitivity to electric fields increases, and this actually increases dramatically with the seventh power, uh, which means actually Rydberg atoms are extremely sensitive to external influences, for example, externally um, varying um, electric fields. Um, so just to give you an idea, we had, uh, you know, up to 17 megahertz at one volt per centimeter electric fields, which is gigantic because the, uh, what you should compare to is basically uh, you know, the line width of the transition, which is in the kilohertz. So you can easily like, shift your line width by, by your, your uh, transition by many, many line widths, uh, even like uh, electric fields in, at the millivolt per centimeter level. Uh, similarly, very important is that, uh, and it's kind of related with this polarizability, because um, the electron is so far away from the core, it's easy to perturb, again, the, the polarizability, basically. But it's even easy to perturb one Rydberg atom by the electric field of another Rydberg atom nearby. Yeah? This gives rise to the interaction between two Rydberg atoms. And this scales with the 11th power of the principal quantum number. And you get gigantic interaction strength uh, between two Rydberg states. So uh, just to give you a number, we could have uh, numbers as high as 2.4 gigahertz at one micron. And again, it should be compared with the inverse lifetime with the line width, a few kilohertz. Uh, and so you see, you can shift your line by many, many uh, uh, line widths uh, if you have another nearby Rydberg atom. And this will, will come uh, in, in more detail. Okay, yes, uh, I mean, this is uh, approximately, uh, I mean, the, the, the scaling laws, they, they uh, strictly speaking hold when n is high enough. So it's, I, I don't think we can directly uh, apply the scaling law to the ground state already, yeah. Yeah, so, so this is, uh, I should say, I mean, of course you have to be in this hydrogenic, uh, hydrogenic limit, basically, the scaling laws to, to hold. Um, but the main point is really here that um, uh, because these uh, electrons are far out, far remote from the, the core, they have these extremely strong polarizabilities, these extremely strong interactions between two Rydberg states. And so I want to basically in the following briefly tell you um, how, we, like a bit more quantitatively, how we get these interactions and, and what they're like and how, how we describe them, and also a bit what, what things we can, we can do with them, what follows. And so um, basically the starting point for this is actually to consider two atoms, yeah? atom one and atom two. And we really just consider them essentially as isotropic charge distribution, uh, distributions. And the size of these distributions are approximately given you know, by the diameter or the radius of these, uh, of these uh, Rydberg orbitals. Then we uh, typically describe these interactions between two Rydberg spaces basically just by electro, uh, electro um, uh, static interaction. So we just consider these uh, two charge distributions and we write down the electrostatic interaction energy between the two charge distributions. And um, these uh, two, um, the, the two charge distributions, of course, uh, they have their atomic eigenstates, right? So you have, uh, um, let's say, a 50s state on, uh, on this atom, a 50s state on the other atom, and electrostatic interaction will actually uh, um, uh, modify these eigenenergies. Yeah? It will perturb the eigenenergies. And these perturbed eigenenergies, by this perturbation here, uh, they basically then give rise to these uh, um, interacting Rydberg, Rydberg interaction potentials. And so um, just uh, in the following for notation, um, I will uh, just denote uh, two atom states um, as um, I J, where uh, you know, I would be the state of atom one, and A would be the state, eigenstate, atomic eigenstate of atom J. And then uh, we will write down this uh, um, you know, perturbation in the, uh, in the atomic basis. And uh, well, uh, basically, to cut uh, uh, away um, a lot of the, the, the team discussion, well, there are now uh, many, many codes available that allow you to then basically just diagonalize the atomic Hamiltonian, uh, which is uh, Hamiltonian of this atom plus Hamiltonian of this atom plus this perturbation, um, uh, just numerically. So what this is, is really just you know, uh, taking this matrix uh, and then uh, diagonalizing the, the full matrix. And uh, you can see basically that if you take two atoms, uh, both the 50s state asymptotically and you bring them close, that is actually you know, a, a 
significant change of atomic eigenenergies, which is basically just the interaction between these two Rydberg states. And there's a lot of other stuff uh, happening around. So of course, we have many other Rydberg states nearby that also have some certain interactions. And of course, uh, for closed distances, uh, you know, everything kind of mixes. And our theory of how to, how to think about this fully breaks down. I will uh, briefly come to that in a second. But maybe let's first try to understand this kind of clean shape here. So what's, what's going on? Um, asymptotically, what, what's the nature of these interactions? So uh, for that, um, I basically want to want to come back to this uh, charge distribution picture here and think about how we can actually, just from classical electro uh, statics, um, how we can simplify these interacting two distributions. And of course, what one can do is one can do multipole expansion. Yeah? And we know that the atoms are neutral, so uh, the terms involving uh, uh, charged uh, uh, distribution vanish, and the first non-trivial um, order that we have is the dipole approximation. We basically have two interacting dipoles. And um, basically, uh, it turns out that um, if you think about the dipole-dipole interaction, yeah, so interaction between these two dipoles here, that uh, if both atoms are in the same atomic state, yeah, so uh, let's say this is an I and this is an I, then they won't interact yeah, because the dipole operator uh, um, only couples opposite parity states. And so if they are actually in opposite parity states, so if one atom is in a P state, let's say 50P, and the other one is in 50S, then they can actually couple. And so you actually get a direct dipole, dipole interaction of these two atoms. Yeah? And uh, this dipole interaction, as you, you know it from just uh, classical uh, uh, electrostatics, scales like one over the cubed uh, distance between the atoms and it scales like the dipole matrix just between the two, um, the two um, atoms. And, and it's really just you know, the product of two dipole operators. And uh, the next case that we can have uh, is, of course, uh, very generally, we can also have the atoms in the same state, right? So we could have uh, um, an uh, atom in, in a state um, I, let's say 50S, and the other state also in the state 50S. And then, of course, um, this direct dipole-dipole interaction is forbidden, but we can still have um, second-order processes where you couple to uh, dipole allowed states, but in an off-resonant virtual way, yeah? and then you couple back to the original state. And then just in, in second-order perturbation theory, what you get is you basically get um, a, a terms that, uh, where you have essentially the square of this yeah, modified by uh, the detuning to this virtual uh, the, the, uh, the tuning between the virtual intermediate level and your, um, your actual intermediate level. And so in the second order perturbation theory, what you get is you get uh, um, a dependence um, that is 1 over r to the 6, and a c6 coefficient, yeah, which is proportional to the, uh, the, um, uh, um, the product of these dipole operators squared. And of course, you know, just uh, what, what happens here, you start with two atoms in a certain S state, then in second order perturbation theory, you, you, uh, per, you virtually uh, populate these levels, and then go back, this is just a standard second order perturbation. And this is, uh, these are the two cases that you can have. You can either have uh, these direct dipole uh, interactions, so one over r cubed, if the atoms are in opposite parity states, or uh, if they're in equal parity states, you can virtually populate uh, opposite parity states uh, in an off-resonant way in second order perturbation and this 1 over r to the 6 uh, van der Waals characteristics. Um, that is kind of, um, the, let's say, the, the usual uh, thing that, that uh, people talk about when they talk about triple interactions. But both are possible. And, um, whoops. Something went wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, so in principle, what I wanted to show you again, I don't know what went one, one, one wrong right here, uh, is there should be a kind of 1 over r to the 6 potential. Uh, and this 1 over r to the 6 potential uh, is exactly, uh, is exact, well, I can show you uh, here. This 1 over r to the 6 potential uh, is exactly you know, this uh, second order perturbation uh, uh, theory potential emerging from coupling to opposite parity. Uh, uh, dipole interaction channels, and so this is the one over r to the six. That's the point. Um, and again, this is because you, you start from equal parity states that have no direct dipole interaction. 
Good. Um, next. Um, now, of course, the question is, um, what, uh, what can we do with this? What interesting phenomena occur? So um, the first uh, question, of course, is uh, thinking about our arrays. Um, I can have many atoms in the ground state, and I, have, I know when, when I excite them to the state, they will uh, strongly interact. Um, so uh, how, how do I do this? Well, I actually use laser to, to excite the atoms. So what, what do I have to know about inter excitation of these strongly interacting root states? And uh, to show you, basically, I just basically uh, uh, the, the ground state here, in addition to this 1 over R to the van der Waals potential of inter Rydberg states. And um, the question is, uh, yeah, again, what, what happens when I try to laser excite uh, to add the ground state uh, into, into these Rydberg states? And well, what, what happens is basically that if I use a laser um, um, to excite two atoms at large distances, um, the interaction is basically negligible. So I, I can just do that. I can just independently drive both atoms. But when I uh, go to small distances, where I strongly repel if both of them are in the Rydberg state, there's actually um, a, a strong detuning to this doubly excited state. So I cannot actually couple from uh, you know, this intermediate state up to the doubly excited state. So my uh, excitation probability is actually strongly uh, modified. And the way it's modified is uh, by basically uh, getting this uh, so-called block rate radius, uh, which is defined as the uh, interaction energy divided by the, uh, the coherent coupling energy. Um, to the sixth root, so it's the point where interaction energy equals the coupling energy. Yeah, and if your uh, interaction is, or the distance is larger, so the interaction is smaller than the coherent coupling, I can uh, freely excite the atoms. If it's smaller, I can only excite a single atom uh, within this uh, 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 excitation block state, this, this Rydberg block rate. So um, if I uh, pick already a Centers here, basically, if I have an array like the ones I've shown you before, and I put a Rydberg atom somewhere in the center, this blockade radius says that there's an excluded volume within which, uh, with a laser, I cannot excite more atoms. So it's just not going to be possible because it's ener energetically. Different. And just to give you an idea, in, in typical systems, this blockade radius um, can be, depending on the principal quantum number, between 1 and 10 microns. So it's actually very well compatible with these distances, both in the lattice also in microtransmission atoms interact over large distances. And uh, basically, atoms uh, modify each other over large distances. And um, I want to basically, basically briefly look a little bit into this uh, blockaded regime again. And actually, I want to uh, consider the case now where um, it's not only a part of the system that is blockaded, but it's really the full system that is covered by this Rydberg blockade. Um, because that's actually a quite interesting to see we can put maximally one excitation to the system. So um, having a, a situation like this, um, if I, I just start from all atoms in the ground state and I try to drive the whole system with a laser, yeah, I could, for example, excite this atom, none of the others, basically. Yeah. Um, I could also excite this atom, but then this would, uh, uh, would basically uh, blockade the full ensemble. Or I could excite any of the others, or also the last one would create the full ensemble. Then um, you can actually work out that if maximum one excitation can be in the system, get and I drive this from the ground state, I get actually a, um, a fully entangled state between all of the atoms within the blockade disk. Yeah? And this is just due to the fact that you can maximally put one excitation uh, due to these strong Rydberg interactions. The question is, of course, can we actually see that in the experiment? And this will be my my first example. Um, the answer is uh, yes, we can actually. So what we can do uh, in the in the quantum gas microscope is we can make systems yeah, that uh, are because they are quite dense, fully within the blockade radius of a good excitation. Yeah. So any any of the the, uh, the any any Rydberg excitation within this ensemble would blockade all the other um, excitations. And now what is nice is that uh, this is actually uh, dramatically simple. Yeah, because uh, the only excited state I have available is the excited state where I have a symmetric distribution of uh, either of these atoms excited. So it's just one state. And I also only have one ground state, which is a state where all the atoms are in the ground state. So I can basically write this down as a two-level system, like basically 
complete analogy to a single atom uh, with, with two levels. The only difference that I have, and this is the consequence for, um, of the fact that that coupled with uh, this entangled state I was describing before, is that the Rabi frequency in the two level system, now this effective two level system, is modified from the air Rabi frequency to a collective Rabi frequency scaling with the number of atoms within the blockade radius. And again, this is the consequence of the fact that this W state, this is the state uh, of, of symmetric superpositions of exactly one atom maximally in the system, um, is, uh, is entangled. Uh, and uh, in the experiment, we can actually just check uh, this uh, Rabi frequency dependence here as a function of how many atoms we put within the blockade. And you can see basically it, it more or less follows um, the square root n scaling um, with the number of atoms we have in the in the uh, blockade. And uh, because this is kind of ana analogous to a two-level system, this uh, this um, uh, system here, this collectively, this fully blockaded system, this was up to a, a super atom. So it's, it's like a, an atom that scales with the uh, Rabi company scales with the root of the number of atoms in the system. And you can see we can very well drive this up to around 200 atoms. Um, and the system is still pretty much fully blockaded. Um, we can also actually, and this is just the last comment, we can verify from the oscillations and or oscillation contrast and also the coherence of, of the Rabi oscillations we measure here, um, extract that the atoms are actually entangled. Uh, so this is something we can, we can see and quantify through a, a so-called entanglement depth. Okay, somehow this got messed up a lot. Uh, so my picture uh, should still be here. So imagine there's a nice Lindbergh uh, uh, um, interaction potential. Um, I told you at large distances, it's basically van der Waals due to this second order perturbation. At short distances, all hybrids lose. There are many crossings. Um, and the question is, okay, uh, what happens in between? Um, there's actually also quite interesting physics there. And so what happens in between is actually, we rem remember the picture, there were, were, was this nice one over R six potential, and there were, there were potentials that were starting to cross down, starting to, to cross up. And you can actually get to situations where in between what you get uh, is you get uh, upward spending potentials and you get downward spending potentials, and they cross at certain distances, yeah? and they can actually also avoid uh, the crossing just by residual couplings in the interactions. And this is kind of interesting because these avoided crossings yeah, can actually host uh, molecular binding potentials. And uh, if you think about it, these binding potentials are actually now describing binding of two Rydberg atoms. Uh, and so you have two highly excited atoms that you bind together uh, using these interactions, these electrostatic interactions. And they actually uh, bind together not at the usual distances uh, where you think about molecules uh, to bind together. But they bind together at distances of up to you know, a micron even. Yeah? So uh, huge, huge molecules. They're still basically just, you know, like, like uh, any other standard molecule described by uh, a coordinate that describes the relative motion of the core, describes the electronic degrees of freedom, the relative motion of the, of the, two, of the two cores is, is uh, you know, very well quantized, and it's very, very harmonic to a very good degree, and we can just, you know, calculate these wave functions um, to a very high precision. Um, again, these are basically standard molecules with the exception that uh, the distances are much larger than in standard molecules, up to micron scale. They are described in molecular uh, quantum numbers they are in Hans coupling case C, um, which basically just means that we can describe them with these uh, with these quantum numbers here. Yes. So this is actually so this is for large distances. And this uh, coming down is also fun for us. Uh, for uh, much shorter distances, so in the spaghetti range, uh, where our electrostatic description breaks down, we will actually start getting exchange uh, contributions and things, you know, will be very different. So this is still in the purely electrostatic uh, regime. What we get is we actually get corrections due to higher multiples. But we are not yet getting exchange uh, interactions. But anyway, so we can make these molecules and questions, of course, can we see them? And the answer is yes, well, in an optical lens, in this case, it's actually no coincidence that the binding length was about 700 nanometers, because that's just the diagonal of, our, of two atoms in our optical lattice. And uh, what we can do is we can basically use spectroscopy in our optical lattice and very, very efficiently associate
differentiate the atoms because they have exactly the right distance. And you see a very nice series of molecular lines. If you do that to the blue of your Rydberg transition, which is basically just you know saying that we are probing this uh, excited uh, um, binding potential here. Um, and you see like many, many, many um, uh, lines. And you can also uh, match this uh, with theory. And now you can say, well, um, what's the point? Um, we want to do quantum computation, quantum computing. Why do we look at molecular resonances here? Well, it turns out that this uh, resonance uh, spectrum is actually a very, very good way to benchmark your uh, potential calculations between Rydberg atoms. Because uh, these, the, the position of these lines depends extremely strongly on the absolute shift of these uh, ripper potentials, which in the end you know, depend a lot on the details that you put into your calculation. And uh, this is actually a very good check of the codes that I mentioned that allow you to uh, calculate the interactions between two ripper atoms. So it's a, in the end, you want an uh, abinish, uh, a check of these uh, methods that also underlie you know, our, our quantum gates and also our quantum simulation. So it's, it's actually quite relevant. And just to, to show you what this looks like, uh, actually when you look at these single shots, so this is a cloud of, of atoms, um, you see basically we always have like pairs of atoms missing for two atoms aligned along the diagonal of our lattice. So we directly see uh, these molecules in this case as lost uh, of atoms from our lattice. All right, this was a little excursion on uh, Rydberg uh, uh, interactions. Uh, just uh, main takeaway uh, messages, um, atom arrays, we, we talked about Rydberg interactions. Uh, Rydberg atoms are highly excited, they're very easily polarizable, and as a consequence, uh, you have very strong interactions that are dipolar, and we can have, and this is the usual, the most widely discussed case, one over R to six interactions in the same order perturbation due to Van der Waals, uh, uh, well, that are of Van der Waals nature for equal parity states, but we can also, in principle, have dipolar, direct dipolar interactions that are one over R cubed uh, opposite parity states. Yep. So yep. when you do the Van der Waals interaction because you talk of two uh, virtual metals yep. in other places, right? So you excite and then uh -huh. you have a second pole? Uh, no, the no it's, it's basically just, you effectively, you know, uh, it's just an effective coupling. So there's the, you don't need uh, another layer, basically. So it's a virtual photon that is exchanged, actually a microwave photon, um, that is exchanged between the two atoms, if you like. Yeah? So if you like, um, if you think about it, um, you have um, uh, your two Rydberg atoms, then one makes a virtual transition down, emits a photon, the other one makes a virtual transition up, yeah, uh, picks up that photon, and then the whole process goes back. This is kind of the way you think about it. Yeah. So it's a virtual microwave photon that's exchanged. All right, um, and now um, I will actually uh, briefly come to applications. Um, and I want to give you a first overview on how you can simulate quantum many-body physics uh, with these Ripper models in optical traps. Um, the first example being easy models. Yeah? And then um, in the end, uh, I will show you how we can do uh, quantum computing with the systems. Um, so very uh, briefly first, um, how do we actually encode easy models as an easy model? Um, well, uh, what we do basically is we, uh, uh, rather than taking two atoms where we have Rydberg blockade and Rydberg interactions, we now take many, so we extend the sum, if you like. But otherwise, we have exactly the same uh, terms that, that um, I discussed before. We have a, a laser drive, yeah, in this case. We have uh, an optical detuning uh, from a ground state in the Rydberg state, so drive and detuning. And then we have this one over R to the six Rydberg interaction. And we have many atoms, that's why we sum, basically. And um, what, we, what we can do now is uh, we recognize there's this sigma e operator here, which is basically just a projector on the, the Rydberg state, um, because we only have interactions uh, when two atoms are in the Rydberg state, not when in the ground state. We can basically just do a um, um, rewrite uh, the sigma e uh, in, in terms of this um, sigma z, uh, which is Pauli z matrix or also in, in terms of a spin operator. And then your model up here will actually turn into a very well-known form, which is the, the easing model, transverse field easing model. So you have a, a field uh, along the x direction, a field along the c direction, and you have a spin-spin interaction. And what you've picked up basically uh, by, by this uh, um, rewriting, by this reformulation, is this additional z field uh, that in a large system is, is actually homogeneous, and then you can just basically compensate for by a, a, 
an overall optical detuning of your um, excitation. Um, just uh, to be clear, what, what this means is uh, we basically encode our e spins, uh, one spin in the ground state and one spin in the Rydberg state. And uh, we have a five term here uh, corresponding to a sigma x, to a transfer field in the easy model. Um, so this would be an hx, if you like. Then uh, we have a longitudinal field, so this would be a, a hz or a bz uh, in, in magnetic field language. And then we have this interaction where if you have two spins that are aligned, um, you get a, a positive energy shift. And if you have two spins that are anti-aligned, you get the opposite uh, energy shift. And we can actually change some uh, sign of this interaction. We can make an anti-ferromagnetic or ferromagnetic transverse field easing models. Um, I don't want to go much in detail, uh, but just to highlight that, um, you know, of course, quantum easing model is one of the prototypical uh, models of quantum many-body um, physics, um, where, you know, there are many, many properties that have been studied. Um, so there's the phase transition here from a disordered to an ordered phase. Um, so disordered means that as X dominates, ordered means that your interactions dominate, so you will get uh, some magnetic properties. The disordered uh, phase is the paramagnetic phase, and it's basically a toy model for a long time and understand many body uh, models out of equilibrium, um, like looking at transport or entanglement spreading, um, quantum thermalization or many body localization. People have studied the disordered versions of, this, uh, of these particles and also for understanding things like, you know, um, uh, flow K uh, uh, systems where, where some of the terms are not equilibrium. So it's really one of the, the uh, most body studied models, I would say, in, in physics. And so here we have a nice realization of this in the lab. So very briefly, uh, let's look at the 1D case. Um, if we look at this 1D easing model, field easing model, um, the long range interaction, what can we expect if we, let's say, ignore the optical coupling for the time being and we only look at the, uh, at the, uh, the two terms um, corresponding to interaction and to uh, field, so increasing the tuning, we'll see, okay, if we, if we just um, have a very small detuning, of course, and we don't have enough energy to overcome the interaction energy, but as we tune up the detuning, yeah, the uh, ground state will be such that uh, we'll actually have uh, more than a rotation in the system, yeah? but because of the repulsion here, these spins will just try to avoid each other, they will basically go to the edges of the system, and this, of course, uh, goes on if you put another rotation in the system because of this repulsion, it will try to sit in the center, maximizing the distance between its neighbors um, and uh, minimizing this interaction term. And of course, um, this goes on. And now the question is, of course, is this uh, uh, something that we can check and we verify this, this uh, physics in the experiment and how can we actually do it? And so um, we did an experiment uh, a long time ago where we looked at this 1D version of this transverse field easing model, and the goal was exactly to try and explore whether one can see, you know, this effect of the repulsion um, in, in such, a, such a system. And uh, so the experiment that uh, we designed at the time was actually um, a bit more complicated than just looking at the tuning axis. So now you actually also have to take into account the life term, because of course, if you think about, it, well, I only have a, an SC interaction, I just have a laser and an interaction, there's no process to flip spins, right? For flipping a spin, I somehow need to drive the atoms. So you also need to count this as x-axis. So you need to drive the spins somehow. And so uh, what you can do is you can actually write down the ground state, the lowest energy state of this model in 1D um, in a so-called phase diagram where on the one axis we have delta, on the other axis we have this drive. Yeah? And if you go and uh, if you go along this uh, delta axis, then uh, what you see here, if uh, the interaction is actually fi fixed, as you see exactly this kind of staircase of you know, uh, excitations uh, in the system avoiding each other, but stepping up uh, in a stair staircase-like fashion. And now the experiment actually was to basically navigate through this uh, phase diagram, if you want, to go from a very well-controlled ground state to, uh, by changing delta and omega to another ground state always so go in an adiabatic way through the phase diagram uh, in a state where we have a certain number of excitation, excitations in the system and then to see if they actually match 
maximally repel as you would expect from energy uh, arguments. And so basically, vary omega and delta when we stopped evolution at different uh, times along this trajectory and just basically track, take a snapshot of the Rydberg excitations and see where they sit. And uh, this is what, what we got basically when, you, when we started basically doing this um, experiment. We saw, well, um, at this point, one was increasing the Rabi frequency, so increasing the drive. At some point, of course, you start seeing some Rydberg excitations, but there's no clear structure. Then ramping up, yeah, so going higher in energy, where you put more Rydberg excitations more clearly, uh, you see, okay, well, if we stop the evolution, we already now see that we get some uh, Rydberg states in the system. And they actually try to maximize the distance, so they mostly sit at the edge. Yeah? And uh, then when we basically slowly ramp down then the Rabi frequency again, you see really that um, looking at the Rydberg density along this Monty chain, there's like this uh, uh, three atom state where the, the atoms are maximizing that distance. So you really kind of see this energetic argument that I gave you um, is, is, is true, um, even if you, if you make this more complicated experiment. And yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's always stroboscopic, basically. Image is always uh, uh, destructive. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so what this is, uh, I mean, this is uh, one way to see this. So it's like following a path phase diagram adiabatically. Another way to see it is more quantum optical way of seeing it. What we are trying to do is basically we are trying to do a landau zina type sweep yeah, where we stay in a state of a system, uh, but in a many-body model. And this is uh, just an alternative. On the, same, on the same phenomena, we start in a very well-defined uh, state where we have zero Rydberg atoms initially, and then we try to adiabatically always follow the ground state yeah, by first ramping up um, the, de the, the detuning. Um, at, well, actually, we, uh, we ramp up the detuning. At the same time, we open up a gap, a many-body gap, so that we can basically um, keep in this lowest energy state. And then eventually, we basically slowly decrease uh, the, the gap um, and, and try to, to be adiabatic to stay in the lowest uh, low state in, during that time. And this is basically what you see here. So basically, we uh, change the detuning. At the same time, we increase the, the Rabi frequency. And we could also first increase the Rabi frequency to change the detuning. But then, you know, this is uh, less optimal. We just basically took a bit of a shortcut. Um, and then we have a place where we only change the detuning. And then we slowly bring back down the coupling to uh, to adiabatically go to the next state. So this is just what you see here. And then you also see what is the big difference in this many-body system compared to a two-level system, for example, that you know very well. It's basically that there are many, many more levels. So navigating through this uh, state space is actually much more challenging. You actually have to really make sure that you don't run through any crossing here diabatically, because that then will create excitations, and you will not probe the ground state. And so this is kind of what's the ch challenging aspect of this work. But as you can see, we can still, still basically probe the, the features of this low energy subspace. So we are not like creating a lot of excitations here. Um, this experiment has uh, been done in a similar way in a micro trap array. Uh, just uh, briefly, they actually um, work in a, in a slightly different regime where the Rydberg blockade, um, so this um, volume, the interaction was uh, smaller. Yeah? And so basically, they see then. Uh, not this uh, larger scale uh, ordering, but they see here the, the orders um, starting from the C2 order where you have uh, Rydberg atom, no Rydberg atom, Rydberg atom, no Rydberg atom. So the blockade is very short range. And it can vary then by varying the distance of atoms in the array, also uh, you know, the range over which you blockade uh, um, neighboring spins. And this was uh, an experiment that was done uh, recently uh, in, the, in these 1D arrays. Um, there was also, and this is actually one uh, thing I want to highlight a bit, uh, some very interesting physics coming out of this array by first preparing this, um, this uh, up down up down state and then actually quenching that onto a new Hamiltonian, changing rapidly the detuning. Yeah? So you basically make first this up down up down state, you change the detuning rapidly, um, and then you let go and just observe what's going on. Um, what what um, they were actually um, able to that contrary to the expectation, the system would not go back to thermal equilibrium, yeah? but the system would actually show persistent um, oscillations here. So this is uh, essentially um, like basically quantifying the fact that you see like these revivals here periodically appearing. And this is what's, in, uh, what's interesting and actually curious because 
um, uh, just from textbook, uh, expect that uh, this system would thermalize because it's a non-integrable system in this case. Uh, so it's a transverse field easing model, one is not integrable. Still, they saw these uh, persistent oscillations, which seems like it's contradicting the fact that non-integrable systems should go back to thermal equilibrium. And it worked out that this is kind of a novel uh, phenomenon that has to do with the specific structure of the initial state um, and the specific structure of the model in combination that uh, here, actually, rather than going back to thermal equilibrium directly, the system would oscillate for some time um, before uh, kind of dephasing over a much longer time than expected. So you can actually find novel phenomena in these systems, even though it's a you know, really simple 1D system. This is something that has been keeping the theoreticians busy for the last couple of years, uh, trying to figure out under what circumstances you can actually get these uh, novel uh, phenomena, these so-called many-body scars, which systems they occur. And I think so far there are actually very few systems only that, that uh, show these, um, these um, out of equilibrium um, persistent oscillations despite being non-integrable. Um, there's also a lot of work on the 2D case. I actually um, don't have too much time, unfortunately, to go uh, too much into this, so I will basically jump a bit now. Um, I think um, what I want to highlight here is um, this whole work um, can also be done in 2D. You can do it both uh, in, the, in the lattice. So this is our experiments that we did. You can see large order structures um, and still basically stay kind of close to the, the ground state. This is the idea, the idea is in 1D, minimizing the energy. And um, uh, similarly, um, you can do this in, in, um, in tweezer arrays where you get very complicated phase diagram basically and uh, despite you know being quite simple you have a regular uh, um, a simple square with long wave interactions transverse driving field longitudinal field um, despite being quite simple there's actually quite a, a large variety of phases that one can explore in, in, in this system and, and that merge basically in these systems so it's a very complicated anybody system and it's actually beyond what you can calculate accurately like exactly sorry with uh, with uh, exact method on any classic computer. So we really like uh, have uh, here um, people had to use DMRG and could do only mo relatively modest sizes. And so relying on these experiments to see what's going on is actually quite quite important. And so there has been this experiment in complete analogy to the 1D case that I showed you before, uh, where you know people started with a, um, a 1D uh, with a 2D tweezer array of about 256 atoms, doing a complicated frequency and the tuning ramp, trying to stay adiabatically in the ground state, uh, connecting this state with uh, another state in the phase diagram, um, and doing this now uh, you know, in this micro trap arrays for different, uh, for different periodicities, so very similar to what I showed you before. And they really see that you can, with very high fidelity, actually prepare the overall ground state, even in this large system. So in this, uh, in this uh, 256 atom system, you get almost a perfect uh, um, uh, you know, correlated system, very long range correlation, so you really stay close to the, the ground state. And um, what I want to highlight here, um, they, they did this, uh, looking at uh, in the different phases that emerge, is that uh, this is uh, an experiment that can check state of the art many body theory in classically completely uh, uh, inaccessible regimes. Um, good. I want to uh, fully skip the Ripper thread thing. Um, this is uh, Something that I, I, I like, but I think um, I rather want basically in the maybe last five, five or um, seven minutes talk a little bit about how we can actually use the system for quantum computing. So this quantum relation set is basically a way to uh, to do many body systems beyond classical um, regimes. But of course, we also um, want to. Uh, this is an analog approach. So we have a certain Hamiltonian that we can encode naturally in the system, that we can run, that we can study. But of course, we also want to go more towards you know, doing digital simulations, digital quantum computing. Um, and of course, the first slide I saw shows um, uh, basically you should answer the question, well, if you want to do quantum computing, what type of qubits can you realize in your system? And it turns out that because there are many different atomic species you can use uh, in, these, in, these, in this setting, there are also very many different uh, types of qubits one could think about. And uh, this is actually, uh, to some extent, similar to also what people have thought about in ions before. So um, what one can do is one can, of course, realize qubits uh, in two different uh, electronic orbitals. 
where the qubit splitting would be hundreds of terahertz uh, so optical transitions. Uh, they would be driven by a single laser, and they can actually uh, have coherence times that vary over a wide range between 100 microseconds and up to more than one second. And one example I actually already showed you of such qubit is, is this ground to ripper transition that's used in all of these uh, uh, quantum simulation experiments before, where one of the spin down state was, so qubit state also called the zero state was the ground state, and the other was the ripper state. But of course, you can also use a, a stable qubit, like, for example, uh, the strontium-88 clock transition, where you can have coherence times of several tens to hundreds of seconds even. So you can really like vary this uh, coherence time dramatically. You can also use um, uh, um, two different stable states in the same orbital, um, where then the qubit splitting would be much smaller. They would usually be driven by Raman lasers, Coherence times typically would be maybe 100 milliseconds or sometimes even seconds. And the advantage here is that one can do actually quite large, uh, quite fast single qubit gates. Um, and examples would be uh, uh, actually something like hyperfine spins, similar to what, what uh, is done in the ions. Or uh, in, uh, you could also think about um, strontium in this case again, where you can encode uh, a qubit in two stable triplet states. Then there's a, a very interesting alternative that has come up uh, quite recently, uh, which is that you can actually encode qubits not in any electronic degrees of freedom, but really in the nucleus. So you can use a nuclear spin as a qubit. Um, here, the qubit splitting would be in the kilohertz range. It's actually split by magnetic field, uh, external magnetic field. Uh, you can still drive this by Raman lasers, surprisingly. It's extremely well protected from environment. You can get uh, very, very long coherence times, several tens of seconds. You so well protected, uh, encoded in the nucleus. And just examples here are strontium-87. This is actually uh, um, has a nuclear spin of 9.5, uh, which means that you have to play tricks to make this into a qubit. Um, but you also have, like, a, let's say, a state qubit realized in terbium-171, where you have a spin 1.5 in the ground state. And this is really a nucleus. And people very recently actually showed that you can get extremely long coherence time. So, variety of, of different types of qubits that we can use. And um, of course, uh, qubit is not everything. We also need two qubit states. And this is where the Rupert states come in. Um, there actually has been for a very long time uh, the idea to use Rupert atoms as, as, um, to mediate two qubit uh, gates between neutral atoms. And, and so that, this is actually one of the, the earliest schemes that I'm, I'm going to briefly show you. So assuming you have uh, your qubit here, your qubit basis, the way you can actually drive gate is by uh, exploiting the strong Rydberg blockade. And I want to see this uh, with this um, case here on the side. If you think about uh, two qubits, you have a control qubit and a target qubit. Your control qubit as a, is in a state one. And from the state one, it can actually be excited to a Rydberg state. Yeah? Um, so what you do is you basically excite qubit one to a Rydberg state. And then as a second, step, you drive your target qubit with a pulse. Yeah? And if you have put your control qubit in the Rydberg state, due to this Ripper state energy shift, this one of R to the six uh, energy shift, we'll actually not be able to drive the second qubit resonantly through this transition. So we'll just basically drive an off resonant pi, a two pi pulse, and the target will end up in the state where it was, or it will stay in the state where it was. And eventually, just bring down the control qubit into its original state. Um, contrary um, to this, when you the control qubit in state zero, yeah, then you cannot, with this first pulse, drive it to the Rydberg state, so there will be no Rydberg blockade, and you can resonantly drive the target qubit through the Rydberg state back onto itself, and that, as you know from two-level physics, will give it a pi phase shift. Yeah? And so you have a controlled phase shift uh, condition on the state of the control qubit um, that allows you basically to realize this control phase gate between two atoms. And this works rather well. Um, this was done recently in a slightly different scheme, um, which, uh, which was using a, a drive both atoms at the same time, but still exploiting the Rydberg blockade. You can see basically that uh, we, we get this with quite decent uh, coherence now, um, where if you, if you run this circuit, basically you can convince yourself that this will create a bell state. And uh, you can show that you know if you look at the parity of this, um, you can back a great uh, fidelity of, of making an, an uh, integrated um, structure of something like 97.4%. So not, not perfect yet, 
but um, we think actually that this is technically limited right now to the lasers. Yeah? It actually took a long time to get this from 80% to 97%, and all that was done in the meantime is actually to make sure that the laser lasers are too noisy, and so I think there's still quite some way to, to improve this. And then some, some, some fancy uh, things about panels are that if you have them in these micro traps, there's a motion automatically built in. And so very recently, people actually started realizing that um, in these uh, platforms, if you can move atoms around, similar to the shuttling technology in ions, you get actually extremely powerful connectivities. So um, what people did is basically um, they had this, this array of atoms, and they showed that if you take an atom, uh, and for example, you take uh, an entangling gate here, like just this control phase gate that I showed before, and you move the atom around uh, in, in a 2D space, that you can transport the entanglement, and actually the, uh, the uh, uh, entanglement is essentially conserved. So both the stationary and the transported um, uh, um, they have pretty much the same fidelity. And you can do this up to, of course, a certain speed with which you move, um, beyond which your, your um, uh, heating will be detrimental and, and entanglement will break. But this is a very powerful scheme because you can now really go move atoms from, you know, any position to any other position and entangle with any other atom. And this is like um, um, a very, very cool feature, and it allows you to really realize novel activities that go way beyond your, uh, your local Rydberg interaction. So combining this motion with a um, high fidelity entanglement gate. And um, just as a, a sneak peek, what they did is basically they uh, implemented uh, very um, elementary uh, versions of um, surface codes um, by basically um, defining certain qubits as ancillas and then just, you know, doing the um, uh, encoding stabilizer by just moving one atom close to its neighbors uh, sequentially um, and then uh, showing basically you get, get uh, quite, quite good um, stabilizer uh, measurements and you can actually realize these complicated connectivities in the first place. And they also, of course, uh, wanted to show that this is fancy and they actually connect this code um, into a toric code, so you use the full connectivity that you have, and, and they also show that uh, you can use this for, for error detection, yeah? So this is, of course, the first step towards uh, also then correcting the errors. But it's a very cool feature um, that comes with a lot of power uh, by using these, these movements of the atoms. Of course, you can also do just plain uh, digital quantum computing. This is another experiment that uh, basically appeared um, um, back to back where they started with an array of atoms, and they showed that they can uh, locally address each and every one of those atoms to do single qubit gates, and also do uh, um, basically bell entanglement gates between neighboring atoms with decent fidelities. Now, uh, one problem that I would say is still uh, there um, up to now is that the two qubit gate fidelities um, are uh, somewhat low at about 94%. Um, and this, I should say now, is uh, gate fidelity between stable qubits. Um, so qubits, for example, encoded in the times time are up to seconds. Um, very recently, people actually started moving towards alkaline earth atoms from alkaline atoms. Um, and these alkaline earth atoms now have uh, uh, basically a lot of promise. So what you see here is you see um, entanglement. Um, well, actually, this is just a single um, atom, uh, Arabi. Uh, oscillation, which has a very, very large contrast, very, very good, driving a single ground state atom into a Rydberg state. You also see this for, the, uh, for driving two atoms in the blockaded regime. You can see now that, that these, uh, these entanglement fidelities are really uh, boosted from this 97.4% uh, to more than 99%. In so using these alkaline earth atoms rather than alkali atoms, uh, in the very recent past, people managed to, to boost this uh, even higher. And uh, I basically, um, I'm almost finished. Uh, this is kind of how this field has evolved in terms of the gates. This is a non-complete list, but we basically come from uh, 2010, where the first gate was demonstrated, uh, to 2015, 2020, basically. And this has been moving up ever since. And um, this is uh, up to now basically the best entanglement gate. Um, I should say, again, this is on a short-lived qubit, on the ground feedback transition. But of course, it shows that in principle the physics is there to make these gates uh, very high fidelity. And so this makes me uh, think that, well, we've 
basically just seen that the icebergs come from these quantum simulations uh, now entering in the quantum computing field with uh, you know, a lot of uh, cool new um, technology that we still, of course, have to develop a lot, a lot further than what we have now. But I think there's a lot to come, and I, I think this is a really exciting times ahead. And yeah, with this, I, I actually want to conclude. So I showed you how to use these um, atoms uh, to make these arrays, uh, how to use Rydberg blockade to make these atoms interact over large distances, and uh, how to basically do both quantum population and antibody physics as well as quantum computing um, and uh, applying gates. And uh, yeah, with that, I'm already over time. Uh, I apologize, and I thank you for your attention.